Changes are coming for the Phoenix Suns, whether they like it or not. Roster changes, mood changes, and also on-court changes. At the center of all of that is head coach Monty Williams. How much blame does he deserve for where things are, and what will he actually change? What do we know about Monty Williams that will lead us to believe he can change some of these things? All that and much more on today's episode of Locked on Suns. You are Locked On Suns, your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns. For the past six seasons, I've said five, but here we are in a new season. Now it is six. Uh, welcome. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen each and every day. We're back to five days a week, so this is your one-stop shop for everything Suns. We're on every audio platform that you can find, Google, audio, uh, Google Spotify, Apple, all of it. YouTube is the best way to support the show, so if you're finding us there, hit subscribe. Drop me a comment. Give me a ranking one through five on your Monty Williams panic level, uh, because that's what we're going to jump in to start today's show. Aaron Edwards is here for his weekly drop in. Today's show, guys, brought to you by Bet Online, which has you covered with more props, odds, and lines than anyone else all year long. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okay. So I want to give you the floor, Aaron, before we get too, too far on the Monty stuff. Um, we were going to record Tuesday. You had some car trouble. Uh, people people are panicked. Some people are panicked about DeAndre Ayton. Some people want to believe the uh, the propaganda that the Suns are putting up on social media of him smiling and chest bumping everybody. Where do you fall? On a scale of panic to Sun social media manager, where are you? Um, I'm like, I've I played sports for a long time. So now, like, I get to, now that I get to sit with it, I'm of the mind that it's not that big a deal anymore. I think once, like, you're being away from your teammates, like, you get to be in your own head. But I, like, I remember just those summer workouts. Like, they were exhausting, and you just got to do the work after a long season that just ended, and you just want to get back. But then the second you're around your boys again, like, kind of all that stuff kind of goes away. And it's not like, like, we know he's insanely close with Mikael Bridges. We know he's super close dancing with campaign and stuff. And I think that once you're around your teammates that you definitely do like, the coaching thing kind of doesn't matter that much because those are the guys you're around the most. I don't think you're wrong. I think I I have to see it in the regular season to, to lean in all the way to that um, because – I don't know. Like, I guess where I come down on it, just like at a human level is that was a choice for DA to do that. Right. Like we didn't, yeah. that wasn't like post practice. The, the son's PR forces him to go do a few questions from the media as he's, you know, in whatever mood he's in, in the, in the spur of the moment, like it's media day. Like, yeah, I can guarantee you. And, and, you know, books better at this than a lot of guys. Cause he, he just is, calmer dude i think than most but book has mastered the diplomacy of media right like yeah i don't even know i could i mean i don't want to call it a lie but like i've lost count of how many times devin booker has looked out at what might as well be directly into my eyes and just <laughs> lied to me like <laughs> straight lying and it's fine because we all know what the deal is and so that's where i come down of like that felt performative to me, and performative only matters if you're trying to, to say something, prove some sort of point. And so that's where that's where I worry, but I do think to a degree uh, you're probably right too. And like I do think he's taken a lot of crap for his whole career. So if something was going to derail him, if he had a weak you know, sense of self and all that, like he would have broken down a long time ago. So I don't think this is the end of – everything i just kind of want to see it but on on the other side of this obviously is monty williams so what did you think when you heard monty brush it all aside and basically say like i don't think any kind of conversation was necessary 
after game seven. And I think it'll be fine and it won't be a distraction. I, that that part surprised me. And it, it's not normally how Monty would handle this stuff. Yeah. I, now that, I mean, we can't really take James Jones, what he says during the offseason as gospel. But if they really were sure that Aiden was coming back, I just don't see how you let that part linger. Like if the coach isn't going to talk to him. So that's what kind of holds me up on that. We were always planning on giving him the contract and all that stuff because you know he's unhappy and your head coach hasn't talked to him all summer. Like that just doesn't seem like it works. So in my head, it kind of seems like they never, they were not all the way sure. So it's like across that bridge when we get here sort of thing. And now it's here and they're kind of like scrambling. But at the same time, like coaches don't have to talk to you during the off season. Like I've, Shout out to Coach Minnick. I probably had three conversations with that dude, and he coached me for three years. So I don't really think that you really like need to have that super tight of a relationship with your coach, even though like he is supposed to be and has to be a big part of this team this year because I really do think – I mean, we're probably going to talk about it later, but Chris Paul's going to have to take a step back, and those points and those playmaking are going to have to come from the, somewhere, and they're paying him a lot to do that. Okay, but basketball has 15 guys. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's not that hard to keep up with 15 people in your life. I mean, if somebody's mad at you, I guess, like, you don't want to have to cross the bridge earlier than you need to. And, yeah, the contract wasn't signed yet. So I think it was yeah. just that we'll know when it happens. And now they're probably going to have to – it's going to be a slow burn, I think. I think the more he's involved in the offense and the better he plays – the better their relationship is going to get throughout the season. And I think it's just going to be built back up through basketball and hoping DA like plays well. Yeah, that's a good transition. So a few things Monty has said uh, signaled that he's going to want to incorporate this year that might be different than we've seen before are one more threes and elbow touches for Aiton. Um, he talked about that kind of weird where he got pretty specific about the ways that he wants to uh, build Aiton up, let him go to work, let him improve. He talked about he thinks an all-star appearance is kind of the next step and all these things he's going to try to do. On the same day that Aiton went in there and and laid an egg or whatever you want to say. So that's interesting. He He's being specific there. Uh, more initiation and creation opportunities for Mikhail and Cam. He talked a lot about that on Thursday today. And then I think overall, like, this one's a little bit more reading between the lines. I don't think Monty's come out and just said it flat out, but more sides on the floor. I, he, he has basically said Dario might play some four next to Aiton, which he's really never done. If you go back and look at the numbers um, of minutes and everything, that's not actually happened that often. And then, I don't know, like, I look at the roster and I feel like size is actually – Somehow I, I feel better about the size and like athleticism of this team than I have maybe at any point under Monty, which I don't think I realize in the moment, but they have a lot of different looks. And so if he's saying charge might play the four, there's all the ripple effects of that. We don't know what the bench is going to look like without Jay in the meantime. So I think size is going to be another thing, uh, which of those. Well, I mean, I was going to say which of those interests you the most, but I also think there's a part of it where it's like, which of those do you buy the most that will actually happen? So however you want to respond to that, but, but Monty's been talking a lot about, about changes this, this, yeah. uh, this week. I mean, he likes a versatile passing big. So I think the Sarge thing, like having him on the floor, a dude that can spread it and a willing passer. Like, I think that's just going to help the offense in general because yeah, we moved the ball pretty well, but it was, it was Chris Paul making great decisions or pretty much just running through the offense. And I think Sarge can find cutters. He can post up. He can pass out of the post. And we didn't have that, like just a passer out of the post. And I also believe the DA thing. Like he, Chris Paul, his usage rate, like even if it wasn't like extreme amount, he can't have a like pound the ball and run pick and rolls all day anymore. And I think it's going to open up us having to use our offense more and using DA more and more versatile and letting him do the things that he definitely has been thinking he can do the last couple of years. So, and like I said, we're probably going to have some growing pains and he even said it. Yeah. We're not fighting to be the one seat. Like I just want us to be like a four or five and just get in pretty nicely. But 
also figure out who we are as a team. Like, I don't think we can do what we did the last two years as an offense and get far in the playoffs. So I'd rather us go through the growing pains and figure out what DA is, how he's going to play, how the offense is going to be, who's going to be our playmakers, than be the number one seed with Chris Paul pounding the ball and running pick and roll. Yeah, the Chris Paul conversation, I mean, it's going to have to be something where it's like, I'm not even sure I have anything to say new until we see it because, like, I mean, this has been, what, basically since Chris Paul started to age, like, yeah, I don't know, the end of the Clippers era of Chris Paul, we've been having the same conversation. You know, is he going to let Blake Griffin have more control? Is he going to... He did let James Harden have more control, but we saw how that ended up. They hated each other by the end of that. And then is he going to let, you know, is he going to have these young sons guys outside of book get opportunities? The answer has been no, 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 outside of Harden. So I kind of just need to see it to believe it. Like he was asked point blank, did you feel comfortable in the moments last year where you might have been in the corner and book was initiating? And he was like, yeah, you know, I've always loved that my whole career. It's like, as we were talking about with book, like you're just not like, that's not true, dude. Like we know we, we watch these games, but um, on the money side, I do tend to believe it. I think losing after game seven makes it a lot easy to accept that step back of let's bring these guys along a little bit and use the regular season for that. Most of the teams that have won championships the past few years have used the regular season to figure things out. They have not been dominant regular season teams that just cruise to a title. They've used that to experiment, to change things up, to try different lineups, et cetera. So I think the Suns could really benefit from doing that. And I think, yeah, Monty probably sees that. And it's easier to get everybody to buy in on that when it's, hey, we just got crushed. We have to change rather than coming off of a finals where you won the first two games and then you lost the last four by single digits. It's harder to say, all right, let's change everything when that's yeah. the case, right? So I I, I think I, I do buy it. Um, it's just going to more be for me the commitment to it, and then if Chris will will be able to commit to it. But uh, the other big story this week that Monty Williams also confirmed today was Cameron Johnson stepping into the starting lineup. It was all but guaranteed when Jay made his announcement, but uh, Cam will be the starter. So let's talk about what will change, how will this look, what can we expect. Uh, first, today's show, guys, brought to you by Bet Online, the number one source for sports betting info all year long, but especially during football season Uh, more podcasts news analysis articles matchup data player developments including injuries and all that that you need to be informed bet online remains your continued source for all sports wagering info with live betting and up to the minute scores for every single game out there but of course we're rounding into basketball season that's what we care about here on locked on suns and you have let's see Championship odds. So this is bizarre to me because the Suns win-loss line and championship lines have not moved. So I would tell you guys to jump while things feel bad, but bet online has been steady. But still, the Suns are only plus 1,200. They're one, two, three, four, five, six in the uh, in the order there at plus 1,200. That's pretty nice. There will be game odds the minute that the regular season kicks off. So do not miss a thing. Head to betonline.net or use their mobile app to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, and so uh, Cam Johnson, he talked about being a starter. Monty confirmed that he's going to be the starter. Can I read you some lineup data here yeah. <laughs> to kick things off? Is that all right? Yep. All right. So in the bubble, we forget Cam Johnson was the starting four in the bubble. Um, US. <laughs> That lineup was Rubio, Book, Mikhail, Cam, Aiton. And it played more minutes than any bubble lineup did. Uh, basically, Monty was like, I'm going to play all these guys 40 minutes because we only have eight games for who knows how long. And we didn't play for the past four months. And he rode them. And they were plus 15.2 points per 100 possessions. So they blew teams out. And when those guys were on the floor and they were on the floor a lot, the Suns crushed. That's why they went 8 No, Last season... Um, this most recent season, Paul Booker, Mikhail, Cam, and DA. So same lineup, but with Chris in there. Only 42 minutes because obviously Jay came into the picture. Yeah. But they were plus 29.5 points per 100 possessions. So doubly as good as that Rubio lineup, but in way fewer minutes. So point being, when 
Cam has been out there with the starters for most of his career, basically. He has been part of incredibly successful lineups. Um, he's averaged 13, 5, and 2 as a starter. His, low, his usage rate is a little lower, which makes sense. He's out there with better players. He's going to shoot a little less. Uh, and then he's played 31 point minutes, 0.8 minutes per game as a starter. So almost 32 minutes per game when he starts. So what are your expectations for Cam as a starter this season? Um, take it any direction you want, but that's pretty good as a starting point. Yeah, um, I'm looking forward to it. I, like I said, like this is the year he has to take the step. So is he going to be like in, initiating the offense sometimes? Like now that where Monty said that he needs uh, Bridges and Cam to get better at initiating the offense and being playmakers. Like is he's obviously going to be a great shooter. Like, is he going to get to the rim and get fouled? Like that would be a huge part of his game that I want to see if he's going to be starting. Like, I just like, I know our offense is going to run a lot smoother and because when Jay Crowder was cold, he was, he goes cold. <laughs> and I think that we're going to see a lot less of those kind of stints with Cam Johnson, even though in the playoffs, it took him a while to get his shot back. I just think it's going to be a lot smoother and Monty's probably going to trust him a lot more than, I mean, not more than Jay, but in the, on the offensive end and on defense, like, like he said, he's just got to be a better rebounder than he has been like the last couple of years, because that's going to be pretty much one of his main, goals that he has to get better at is rebounding the basketball and the team's just going to have to rebound better. Uh, also. Yeah. I checked that out and it's kind of interesting on the rebounding side because it's one of those things where they've kind of just figured it out. Like it never, I'm not going to come here and obviously like cam was open about it today. Like he even said rebounding needs to be the focus um, for himself in terms of what he's going to need to step up at, do better than he has done because he'll be starting um, but, you know, in the bubble last season, like lineups with Cam and the starters have rebounded about as well as any other Sens lineup. Now, rebounding's always been a problem. So, like, in an ideal world, you would want Cam to be an even better rebounder than Crowder. Yeah. But I don't know if that's a realistic baseline for him. So I agree, like, that'll always be something to monitor. I think that's where you'll see Dario being a four sometimes, maybe maybe be helpful. Um different guys being able to step in. And when you're in some of those mixed lineups with benches and starters, maybe you can just own the boards a little bit better when it's Tory Craig or it's Ish Wainwright or Bismack Biombo in there. We'll see. I think rebounding is definitely one. I think the other two that I worry about with Cam, because I agree they're going to be able to do more on offense. They're going to be harder to guard. They're going to be able to space the floor better with Cam than they did with Jay. Like that's, that's the point. That's why he's here. That's why he's going to step into that role. Um, I think wear and tear, like, can he hold up physically? And then kind of along with that defense, and that's not, an, that's not a, a surprise to anybody, but it's not even so much that I think he's like some worst defender. It's that he, what he does on defense is not the same as what Jay did. And I think that's the thing people underestimate. So the wear and tear side, like he admitted, I asked him on media day about the, the quad injury and if, if it was still affecting him come playoff time, if it, if it wasn't, whatever. And he was, as he always is, very honest. And he was like, yeah, I, I, I basically rushed it back. Like I shouldn't have come back, but it's the playoffs and I, I wanted to be there. And he's like, I'm not saying that's why, but you always wonder when you don't play your best if an injury is going to hurt you. And at every single point of his career, when he's taken on a big load, he's ended up hurt. So yeah. I don't know what to do with that. Defensively, I think the thing is like he just doesn't he does he's not going to be able to guard the same kinds of guys that that Jay does, right? Like and you can yeah. go right to the most pro, high profile moment of this this era of the Suns is the finals. Yeah. And the Suns started those games with Jay guarding Giannis and Aiton on on Lopez. That just doesn't work anymore. You can't no. <laughs> start games with Cam guarding Giannis. So that's just going to be a fundamental problem. Yeah, and he just has a problem with big dudes that play strong. Even like Luca was abusing him, <laughs> and like I and there was like no way around it. And I just think strong dudes like uh, Julius Randle, he's gonna have to guard those kind of dudes. AD, like he's gonna have to guard dudes that kind of want to bang a little bit down there. And that's probably my biggest worry is when the guys that like putting their shoulder down when he's in front of them, they're gonna attack him a lot and. 
that's going to be a really big part of his job now is guarding those type of dudes. Yeah, in the regular season, it's like you mostly like the Suns are just going to let whatever may, might happen fall into place, right? Like you don't see teams overreacting in the regular season unless yeah. Cam is, and I don't think he is, like so bad where it's like an active issue every single night. You're mostly just going to see the Suns let Cam guard whoever the four is on the opposing team, try to adjust, hey, let's send some extra help when this guy – is in this spot, you know, he likes to go right, let's load up on that so Cam isn't exposed, all these different things that they can do. But there are going to be games where it's just a complete mismatch and then you really worry about it in the playoffs. And the thing that I think is going to be the big, the other problem aside from like, yeah, you mentioned AD, Giannis, these guys in the playoffs where it's like, yeah, if you have a mismatch there, they're going to go at it every single time down the floor. Those are going to be obvious. We'll wait for the playoffs to come to really – I guess worry too much about that, but that's one part. The other part is there was this ability, the, the, the domino effect basically of it, because there was this ability that you had if you're Monty Williams, when Jay could guard those types of players where that then freed up Mikhail to be able to guard the guys he's most comfortable guarding. Right. So like, I think yeah. the nets are a perfect example. Like now you probably have to have Mikhail guard KD, right? Because I don't yeah. think you necessarily want to put Cam on him, whereas Crowder could have done it. So now yeah. it's like this domino thing of, okay, now now Mikhail's going to have to change up who he might have typically guarded, and then everything just starts to get rearranged. That's part of what I worry about. Yeah, because you always want to put a stronger guy with good feet on KD. That's why P.J. Tucker and him have just always gone at it. So I just think it's going to change the way our defense looks because – Crowder kind of never had an issue banging down there, regardless of who it was. And he would, like, annoy you if he got switched on to a big. Like, he would still put up a fight. And I've just never seen Cam, like, really be put through the fire like that, at least not yet. And during this season, people are going to see him and know that he kind of hasn't yet. And coaches are going to test him and see if he's really willing to kind of stay in front of dudes who are, like, really down to bang. Yeah, I have I have Tatum and Brown. I have the Nets. I made a list of like I could see Cam struggling against X or the Suns struggling to defend these guys because yeah. Cam's there. Even dudes like Jimmy, like what? Jimmy Butler type dudes, like those yeah. kind of dudes that like I'm getting to the rim and there's nothing you're gonna do about it. Like Ingram strong. and Zion in New Orleans. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like some of these are like everybody is gonna it's struggle, gonna right? Like yeah. everybody's gonna struggle against Ingram and Zion. But if you're a team that wants to win a championship, you'd like to have an answer there. So I guess to close this out, my question for you is, would you switch more if you're the Suns? Do you think that's something we see them do that way? Because I think everybody can kind of hold up enough. I don't see a huge weak, weak link. That's the thing. It's like Cam's not a bad defender. It's just he's not quite a four in the NBA with the best team. So do you think they switch more? Yeah, I think, well, we kind of did that in the first place. So I want us to switch less because that's what got Chris Paul in trouble in the first place. So I just don't want us to give up easy switches. Like, play it like the Warriors did. Like, I think that they never gave up the switch easy. They kind of put up a fight. And by the time you tried to get the ball to the dude that you wanted to, like, the shot clock was at, like, 15, like, 8. Like, you kind of just need to fight those screens and kind of let them run the time down on their own. And we were just letting them – like, we just got to stop letting people get whatever switch they want. I know we're going to have to do it to help Cam out, but I'd still rather a switch as little as possible because that's what gets Chris Paul in trouble. Well, you talk about the war – I mean, Luca made us switch us. You made me say us. Luca yeah. made the Suns switch when – he because he can beat any defense. It's the same thing as LeBron. Do you want to switch against LeBron? No, but that's the, the worst – the best of all the evils – I think the thing, and you bring up a good point with the Warriors, you could see, too, as an alternative is maybe a little bit more hedging and blitzing because I do think Cam is, he can move a little bit better than, you know, 30-plus-year-old Crowder. Mm -hmm. And Crowder was a player who could do that at, at one point. It's just he's older now. and but, but, but Cam probably can. So maybe there's a way to do that when you're, you know, when Cam is guarding in the pick and roll, which isn't going to happen all that often. Yeah. I mean, I think the, po the point is with all of this, if you have Mikhail and Ayton, I think 
the Suns are making a bet right now that they can figure it out with those two guys defensively. Those two plus smart, engaged, uh, you know, active defenders around them is going to be a recipe for a good enough defense to win a championship. I mean, that's that seems to be, to me, what they're betting on. But uh, I want to transition into Jay Crowder in the trade because I think, obviously, there, w- there might be a missing piece. They might get a new rotation player that changes some of this if they trade Crowder. So uh, let's get into options there and whether they should go guard, go wing, go big with that possible trade. First, one more quick break. Okay, so if uh, if anyone listening follows Aaron or me on Twitter, we were uh, we were joking about this today, but a popular trade, especially now that Lonzo Ball is out for months, if not longer, uh, which is a big bummer, but is the Bulls need something? They need more wing depth. Like right now, it's looking like: Do you start Zach Levine at the one and Demar Derozan at the two? Like it's. <laughs> It's very awkward for them, and I think Crowder would solve a lot of their problems. You're not getting Levine. You're not getting any of their big guys. But Kobe White has been somebody who seems like he's been on the trade market since, I mean, like his second season almost. (laughs) Uh, I think he could be a a spark plug off the bench. They have some filler salaries to make that work. He makes a little bit less than Jay. Um, Tell me why you like this deal. Is it just that, that White... Can, can chuck up some shots, or is there something else to it? Um, I like the energy that would come off the bench with him. Like, he's, like, not – like, he's not a great shooter, but I think that he – it's just the campaign thing. I'd rather have Kobe White out there. He plays with confidence. He's gotten really big minutes before, and I think that a kind of player like that off the bench would just help the offense out, and I think that he can learn under Chris Paul – to be a real point guard. I still think he has that in him. And yeah, I just like the way he plays. And I think not giving him that many minutes would just be really good for us too. I mean, I totally hear you in terms of he, he's, he's at least as good as campaign already. And, and I think because he's younger, you feel like he could end up being better. Um, he, he way improved his three point shooting last year. And he super cut down on his turnovers. And like just looking at his stats, those two things jumped out to me. I also feel like Chicago's been, they just don't play very fast. Whereas like yeah. coming out of college, obviously North Carolina guys with the way they run that that transition game and, and the fast break and uh, everything else, that's always going to be a plus for them. But him especially, he just was really, really natural making those hit ahead passes, taking pull up threes, just keeping defense, the defense off balance. And then he got to Chicago, and he's been a half-court guy. So yeah. I think if you get him into Monty's system, he he can be somebody to push the pace, similar to what Payne has, do- has done, and you could even see him look even better. The main reason I like this deal is I think White's a pretty decent player, but you turn Crowder into another like potential asset, right? Yeah. Like he's somebody <laughs> within you. He's, on, uh, he's going into the fourth year, I think, um, yeah, I think he's eligible for an extension right now. Um, yeah, because he was the same class as Cam. Damn, so yeah. they could extend him now, or they could go into restricted free agency next summer and keep him. And that's just, to me, that's a little bit more enticing than like an exp- another expiring salary or some sort of mediocre veteran. Like those are the types of other players that, you know, teams are going to want to offer for Crowder if it's a one-for-one type of deal. So I think White's value is low enough where you could go get him basically one-for-one, but then he's somebody you keep and he becomes a a salary you can use or a player who could get better, and they don't have a lot of those right now. Yeah, and I think that's kind of going to be a big deal because we've kind of not been talking about it, but January is going to be here quick, and that's just going to be one of those things where people start bringing up Aiden and all the other stuff again. And I just think having assets is the best right now because us having all of our picks and having as many assets as we can have would just be big for even the future. And I just think that's really important to have right now. That's interesting. Okay. Cause that's a good transition. Cause the last thing I wanted to hit is that trade is kind of a short and a long-term play. Although I think it's probably more of a long-term play. Cause I don't think what Kobe white is right now is like a huge, huge difference maker. I feel like I would be 
using the opportunity of Crowder because I think using the opportunity of Crowder to try to make a bigger swing for the fences right now because I think if you're looking one for one, it's going to be deals like that. Um, and I think if you're looking a little bit bigger and you're willing to give up a little bit, I would be really hesitant on first round picks. If, if you had to give one up, maybe you do it. I don't know. Um, but trying to loop Crowder into something a little bit bigger, you know, maybe it's Shamit, maybe it's Craig, some of these smaller salaries to add to Crowder to get to a difference making player. That's a little bit better. Somebody that you feel like could be a, a playoff rotation player, because like, I just don't think you can make a deal right now that results in you being one rotation, like bonafide playoff guy <laughs> short of where you are right now. Like they already, we felt like they didn't have enough the past couple of years. And this would be them losing one. Cause I don't think white is as interesting as he is like, you're not going into the playoffs next year being like, all right, and then Kobe White's our sixth man, and you know that's not yeah. what he is. Yeah, I I mean, I would rather us go bigger and just say screw one of those picks and sham it. Like, I would – if we're going to go for it, like, just do it. Like, say screw the pick then. And if we're going to – like, I saw somebody say Karis LeVert today. I saw Buddy Hill today. Like, if we're going to go crazy, like, let's just go for it and – really get an important piece that's probably going to be here for the next two to three years. Yeah. I'm not a Karis LeVert guy. <laughs> I, I kind of assumed. Yeah. He's no, also not. always injured. So <laughs> always injured. Yeah. I mean, I just, it's funny though, because I'm also the guy who's been championing Jordan Clarkson all summer. So yeah. I just <laughs> think if you're going to be Karis LeVert, if you're, if that's the type of player that, you know, whether you're a team wanting to get a type of player like that, or if you are that player, you at least have to take and make threes. And if you're not going to do that, it's just like in the NBA right now, guys who take a bunch of twos and don't make a lot of them and take some threes, but don't make a lot of them. Like, and you don't pass, like that's yeah. not, it's just, there's a reason that there's not a lot of uh, Jordan Crawford's anymore, right? Like yeah. those guys, Marshawn Brooks, <laughs> like those guys don't exist because it's not super valuable thing to, to do. Um, so I know Zach Lowe brought up John Collins. If the Suns were able to get John Collins, that would be really good. I, I mean, it would complicate the can thing we just talked about. It that really would be a little <laughs> bit awkward. Maybe that's why it's not super likely. Um, but I mentioned Derek White online. I mentioned Dylan Brooks. Uh, Duncan <laughs> Robinson sort of falls in this group. I'm still a big believer in him. I know there's not really any reason to be a big believer in him. No. I just <laughs> think he – I just think he was on the floor against a peak LeBron and AD Lakers team in the finals. And if Spo trusted him to do that and they won two games and he was in the you know in clutch time – yeah. I just have a hard time believing less than two years later, he's just broken. But do those three guys feel like better to you? I mean, do they feel gettable to you? Robinson's gettable. That's not, yeah, that's Robinson's not a question, gettable. but I guess Brooks and White. Yeah, I think, yeah, Robinson's gettable. He's abysmal on defense. It is like really, really bad. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess he is, but he's big. Uh, he, I don't know, whatever. We don't need to argue about it. If they <laughs> trade for him, we'll do a show about it. But yeah. Um, yeah, I do think the other two are gettable. Like you said, the John Collins thing would make things really complicated, but I think it would make our switching ability that much better. Uh, dude that's willing to, he can stay in front of big people. He can move and stay in front of small guys. Like, I think that would, and he's willing to shoot the three. Like, he's not great, but he's willing. Like, I think that would help a lot. I think it would cost a little bit more than I would want it to, though. Yeah, I think with White or Collins, you're absolutely giving up a pick. I, I want to end on on Brooks, and I know we're, we're a little bit long here, but I'm going back and forth on this one because he's, he's in a weird spot where he's actually an expiring contract because he was a second-round pick, so he signed that second deal early. Yeah. So he's only 26. He's, his second contract's about to be done, which <laughs> is weird, but he'll be unrestricted because of that next year. And, you know, Desmond Bain. I mean, I know the, the Grizzlies just traded to Anthony Melton, so they can't get rid of too many guys. But Bain is clearly the, the yeah. starter there 
long term. They have plenty of other wings to fill that three spot. They have Jaron Jackson, who's their four of the future. Like they're gonna have to pick who their core is soon. And I don't feel like 26 year old expensive Dylan Brooks is going to be that. So I could see them being a little bit encouraged of, Hey, if we can get somebody like Crowder plus something else, a couple seconds, I don't know if that gets it done. I could see them moving on, but then you look at it statistically and it's like the dude has averaged 16, 17, 18 points per game the past three years. That's a pretty valuable player. You don't just get rid of those. So what do you think it would take? Is it going to take a first to get Brooks too? Giving like I get what he brings to a team, but giving up a first for Brooks is tough. Like, dude is a chucker, and I know you say I like chuckers. But... He shot them out of game. Like he <laughs> lost them basketball yeah. games. That's how yeah, bad it is. So it. like, yeah. if you can get the chuckerness out of them and just kind of like keep them at like the Eric Gordon range, like he would be our knockoff Eric Gordon essentially. <laughs> so I think like yeah, possibly, but. He's he's got to get the chucking out of control because he lets that thing fly. Yeah, and it's not very efficient. I mean, it's like forty one percent, forty two percent, forty three percent the past few years. Last year, his three didn't go in. But defensively too, like he he is a yeah. stopper. Like he he plays hard as hell. He has been a guy who has locked down Steph Curry over the years. He. He would be exactly what you want, um, you know, and I think he would accept coming off the bench. I mean, he's been mostly a starter. I guess he's really only ever been a yeah. starter, so maybe not. But he, he needs to accept coming <laughs> off the bench. He's not, I mean, play the way he does. That's a bench player. That's not a starter. So I don't know. That's what I'm trying to convince myself of because I think you could probably get him without giving up a first. I don't know what that other piece is. If the Grizzlies really love Landry Shamit, maybe you get something done, but – that's the sweet spot where you don't have to give up a first. The other team has some sort of incentive to get rid of their player. And then you can kind of come to the, to the middle on it. But uh, yeah, I don't think Kobe white would be bad. I have no idea where this is going to end up. I think the Suns are probably looking at everything because you saw them with that Bogdanovich yeah. trade. They were reportedly going after Vanderbilt and that's them trying to do both things. Like, yeah. like I'm talking about where you get that future asset. You also get something for the short term and you try to kill two birds with one stone. And, I don't know. They're going to do that, but then there's going to hit a point where they just have to compromise. Yeah, like, it. I'm down with them trying to knock both out and trying to make the team, like, extremely better and kind of over-asking a little bit. I'm kind of down with them doing that instead of just getting one piece and us still needing another piece later on. Like, I'd like he's he knows how urgent it is, and now I know that he knows. Because first I was like, does James Jones know that this team's not going to do well or not going to really – play up to the standards that we've gotten used to the last two years. And now after I saw that he was trying to get Vanderbilt and trying to get Boggs, like now I know that he knows how dire this is. Yeah. And you heard Monty say that he, his hope is that something can get done before the start of the regular season, which is like two and a half yeah. weeks away. So I think they're, they're going to ask, ask, ask. And then maybe if it gets close to the season, then we do see like a Kobe white type trade or, or something small, but I don't think there's anything wrong with asking big. I think this is one of the last opportunities left to flip something for to keep the asset piling up going because the Suns don't have a lot of that left. So I think it would be a missed opportunity not to explore it. But that'll do it for the week, guys. A big thanks for making Locked On Suns your first listen here Monday through Friday. October is coming, which means basketball is coming. Monday will be uh, preseason game number one recap. We'll also have thoughts from the open practice, which Aaron will be at. So we'll have uh, we'll have plenty. Hit subscribe, hit follow, whatever platform you're on, and uh, don't miss the show. In the meantime, go make Locked On NBA your second listen to catch up on everything else going on around the league.